It's been a little bit. I think it's about time I show you an update on my self-hosted voice assistant, powered by Home Assistant, Raspi, and Python. I want to show you what's new, what's to come, and an actual demonstration of all the things it can do since I did think that was missing from the last video. And speaking of, you might have thought that straight after that last video, I, I noticed it making fat stacks, that's zero money to be clear, but two and a half thousand views in a month is massive, that I'd have tried to get this video out immediately. But it's a month later, and clearly that didn't happen, because I'm just not organized enough, and I don't want to milk it, so I wanted to try and make a, another kind of hefty video. I'm, I'm expecting this one to be about 20 minutes. If you've got no clue what I'm talking about, up in the top right, there's going to be a link to that previous video where you can take a look, and then at the end screen of that video, there'll be a link back to this one, so you can come back here and carry on. Also, since normally by at this point, 50% of you have already clicked off, I may as well tease Hardware should be ordered within the next week, so hopefully things soon I should be able to make them self-contained rather than plugging in an external mic and external speakers, and after that I want to be working on seeing if I can make a network of them, then I can start working on the CAD, like 3D modeling and, and making a housing for it. Not yet, because I'm not ready for that. Anyway, how's it been going and what's new? Firstly, more natural and varied responses. Obviously, it's functional for it to say the same thing every time we ask it to do the same thing. But it just doesn't sound very natural, and even though that's probably fine, I got bored at some point and wasn't really sure what to add, and this seemed easy to implement. So every time we say something kind of generic, we could actually put a, a bunch of different words into that same sentence and it would make sense. So I've just got a list of those words. So when we're agreeing with the user, um, like we're saying, I will do this, then we can say sure, or got it, or will do, or okay. Um, and, and they'll all sound fine in the same sentence. And so now, when we need to do that thing, rather than having any of those words directly in the response, we just tell it to start the response by picking a random word from that list. So if I ask it for the time, it might say right now it's 4.53pm, or, currently, it's 4.53 in the evening. Next, the timer stuff, which for me is really important to get right since it's 90% of what I use a voice assistant for. So, I've added two things. The first is being able to check how long's left on a timer. So we do this by every time we increment the timer by a second, we just write that change to the file, we write how many seconds are left in a file, and then when I want to find out how many seconds are left, I ask it, and then it just reads what's in the file, it divides it by 60 to get the number of minutes, and then it looks at the remainder, after dividing by 60, for how many seconds are after that. And we also check whether there are 60 or more seconds to check whether to include minutes at all. It does add drive access because we're writing to a file, which I, I really don't like because we're on a micro SD card, and even on a USB flash drive, it, that wouldn't really be any better but I don't know a better solution for now, even if I would like to find one. And the next is being able to cancel the timer. The old way I'd handled this is just tell it to stop before the timer was done, and then when the timer was done, it would skip playing a sound and it was fine, but it meant that I couldn't actually start a new timer until that old one was done, and it would still keep timing, which would put more wear on the drive, even if just by a little bit. So I wanted to add a proper way to do that, so again, we use a file. Every time we increment the timer by a second, we just check if the cancel file exists, and if it does, we break the loop, and then we say that the time has been cancelled. And it's smart enough to know whether there is a timer running, so when I tell it to cancel the timer, if there isn't one running, it won't just make the file anyway, it will just tell you that there aren't any timers running. And before we carry on, if you're wondering how any of this works, all of my code, as well as explanations for it, are available in the GitHub link in the description, um, I've also actually updated that with a table of contents, so it should be a bit easier to navigate, as well as just adding my actual Python script that I actually use, if you just want to see the whole thing separate from any guides and separation and like iterating on it to explain how I got somewhere, you can just see the whole final thing. All of my work, so not Raspy and I don't think Home Assistant, but everything I've done is licensed under the GPL. Which, if you don't know what that means, basically, if you want to use my code that I've contributed, you can, no matter who you are, no matter what you want to use it for, without paying me anything, or even crediting me, I don't think. But you just also have to share your code, any additions you've made to it, also under the GPL for anyone else to copy and use how they feel. But anyway, next is brightness control. 
it was another thing that I'd kind of overlooked at first and I didn't think would be useful, but once I added my Yi light, which we'll get to later, I realized that having brightness control was pretty important. It's a really simple one and there's not really much interesting I can tell you. I just added a bit of code that talks to Home, Assistant, Home Assistant's API that handles controlling light brightness. And then if you ask it to set the light to a certain percentage brightness, it'll do that. As a side note, dim your lights if you've never like realized you could do that with smart ones most of the time you don't need them at their full brightness and even though they are leds so they're fairly efficient they're probably using more power than you need so you could decrease it but now that ye light from before this isn't something i've given this the ability to do it's just something that comes with using home assistant but i feel it's important to mention i've added my ye light and actually i want to go on a tangent a bit about ye lights they do have european servers but they just don't function so I was convinced for a bit that my Yeelight's smart bits were broken because it was appearing in the app, but it would always time out when I went to repair it. So I've just been barely using my, my ceiling light and just been using LED strips. But it turns out it does work as long as I give them permission to process my data in China and use their Chinese servers, which is just another problem with cloud connected things. And this doesn't solve the setup problem. Your Yeelight still has to be set up connected to the cloud. But unlike connecting it to the Google Home, I don't need to link any accounts with my Xiaomi account. Blueberry, and so Home Assistant, can actually just talk to it through the local network. So if Xiaomi servers go down after your light's been set up, it just doesn't matter. Another benefit of doing that way is the light responds instantly, which is, it doesn't actually matter. The light going a, a second after you tell it to turn off isn't a big problem, but it's, it's really fast now. And finally, before we get to the demonstrations, I've added it. And finally, before we get to demonstrations, I've added the ability to use it as a Bluetooth speaker. Just like with a Google Home or an Echo, you just ask it to turn on Bluetooth pairing, it turns on for 30 seconds, and then if you connect, it'll keep you connected until you disconnect your phone. But if you don't, it'll go invisible after 30 seconds again, so other people can't just connect to the Bluetooth speaker. I don't use this particularly often, but it's something I have used on my Google Home and I thought it should be possible, and it was. But even though it does work and it works consistently, I hate how it works. The kind of base that this is built on is I found an open source Python script that will make your Linux computer appear as a Bluetooth speaker. You can connect to it and the audio will just play through whatever speakers you've got connected. But I wasn't sure how to launch that with my voice and I couldn't figure that out. So we've got a system service that looks for, three, two, one, you got a guess, <laughs> a file, at least I'm consistent. Then once that file is found, it deletes itself after three seconds, but also that service then launches two things. One is that Python script itself, and the other is a script that will wait 30 seconds and kill that Python script. That, th the reason it goes invisible after 30 seconds, like I mentioned before, isn't that script being killed though. It's the fact that I went into the actual Bluetooth configuration, like in the Linux install, nothing to do with Python, and I've made it so if it gets a request to become discoverable, it will only do that for 30 seconds before going away again, and killing that script after 30 seconds is just so that there isn't always a script running. It's absolutely ideal in every way. My phone can even smell that something's off when I connect it to my phone, as opposed to, I don't know, you, you could connect it to a PC if you really want to use that with a Bluetooth speaker, but when I connect it to my phone, in the Android settings, it says, turn the device off and on, there's been a problem. Despite that though, it does send audio, all the volume controls work really well, and the latency is actually really good. I was expecting with a solution like this that, I, I don't know, I thought you might have to put more optimization work into making the latency good, but it's, it's actually pretty decent. There's absolutely no problem with you know, just playing and pausing music and not having to wait for a few seconds, it takes less than a second for it to respond to, you know, play, pause, or, or hearing the volume change. Right now, I'm just using the Raspberry Pi's built-in DAC, but I do intend to change that in the future because it's not really made for this. Though, despite the bad specs, it does function. The sound is noticeably soft, which I particularly unhelpfully cannot really distinguish for you, the difference between soft and quiet, but you can hear it. You, you, you can tell that something's off about it, but if I didn't have a proper Google Home right next to it playing audio, I don't think most people would actively complain about it. It can sound better and it will sound better in the future, but it's not awful. 
There is one big problem I'm aware of, which is that if you unpair a device and then go to pair it again, it just won't let you. But I don't think that's too big of a problem because normal disconnecting works fine. You don't have to unpair your phone. And also there is a solution for this unlikely to show up problem. And I've got it in the GitHub guide if you do come across it. But other than that, it, it does just work, even if I really, really dislike how I've gotten Bluetooth audio to work. But now let's shift over because one of the big things I was thinking was missing from the last video was an actual demonstration of just everything it can do right now in this moment. So. Let's take a look. So I should probably explain exactly how things are going to be laid out. I'm just going to say the command. I'm going to explain the different options it has. And on screen, I will have a recording of what the command is recognized as. And I'll show you the kind of the actual raspy sentence itself for how it's recognized. So firstly, we've got the three ways you can control a light. Power, brightness, and color. Basically, <laughs> all those do is check for whether we said on or off, and then check for which light we said, and then tells Home Assistant to do that thing to that light. So, if I do blueberry, turn on the ceiling light. Okay, I'll turn it on. It's quite bright outside, so I apologize if you can't tell that it did that, but it did. And then I can do blueberry. Make the ceiling light 50%. And now I can see why you probably couldn't tell before, because I had my light on its normal 1% brightness uh, that, that I prefer. Um, so maybe you can tell that it changed brightness then. I can also show you that it can the same light can be called multiple things. So it's my ceiling light, but also it is a Ye Light branded light. So I can say Blueberry, set the Ye Light to 100% brightness. And now it's brighter. And then I can do the color one, so blueberry. Make the ceiling light blue. Okay, I'll make it blue. And then for all of those, it responds as like a confirmation, so you know it's done the right thing. It tells you that it's turning the light on or off, or wh whatever percentage brightness it's going to, or the color you've set it to. So if I do a different one, blueberry. Make the ye light hot pink. And there we go. You probably can't see that very well, but it is. So next is the do maths intent, which just takes two numbers and an operator. The numbers are anywhere from minus a thousand to a thousand, just because getting past that voice recognition is going to be quite unreliable. And also you have to remember for this not to say a hundred or a thousand because that doesn't really work very well. It, it recognizes 100, but often if I'll say a hundred, it kind of converts that into 800. So I can say blueberry. What's 10 plus 23? That's 33. And then I can do subtraction, blueberry. What's 78 minus 10? That's 68. Blueberry. What's 43 times 12? And finally, blueberry. What's 280 divided by 9? That's 31.11111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111111
and then we'll wait a few seconds. Blueberry, how long's left on the timer? There are 40 seconds left. And then Blueberry, cancel the timer. Timer cancelled. But there's also a functionality of the cancel timer and timer remaining functions where it just knows if there's a timer running. So now the timer stopped. If I do Blueberry, how long's left on the timer? It knows. Next is get weather and get time. I'm just putting them in the same category because they're both fairly simple. Um, if I ask it for the time, Blueberry, what time is it? At the moment it's 1.27 p.m. And this is part of what I mentioned before about it kind of randomizing the responses. So if I ask it again, Blueberry, what time is it? At the moment it's 1.27 there we go. Um, and then it does the same thing for the weather. If I ask Blueberry, how hot is it? At the moment, it's 20 degrees and cloudy. 20 degrees. I'm not a fan. Um, but then, because we have the other options of the different ways we can speak to it, as well as the different ways it might respond, um, and, and the same thing goes for the time, I could phrase that a bit differently. Instead of how hot is it, I could say, Blueberry, what's the temperature? Those are some of the simplest kind of raspy sentences because they don't really take any input. We're just saying words and it's sending just a generic, I want the time and I want the weather. What we say doesn't actually change what it's telling the code to do. Um, so we've just got some optional words so we can phrase it kind of differently, but they're all really simple. There's also the greetings one, which doesn't need any explanation because for now, even though I intend to change it, I want to make it kind of more advanced. Like, I would like it to, if you tell it good morning in the afternoon, it will whinge at you and, and things like that. But I haven't done that yet. So it's exactly the same as the example uh, that's provided in Raspi's code. So if I do Blueberry, good morning. The text-to-speech doesn't handle single words very well. That sounded kind of weird. Let's try it. Blueberry. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, more, more long responses would probably be better. Next is actually one that's so new that I added it between filming the last section and filming this now, just because I, I thought it kind of made sense for it to be able to do. Unit conversion. So we've got uh, the just two optional words so we can phrase things differently. Number unit one into unit two. So we can say 10 liters into milliliters. Blueberry, convert 10 liters into milliliters. 10 liters is 10,000.0 milliliters. So because I've asked that before, that's why it responded so immediately. Right now, the way I've got things, I would like to have it confirm with you that what you said is what it's responding to. I'm not sure how to explain that. So it confirms that it's turning 10 liters into 10,000 milliliters. And removing that would make it respond much faster normally, but because I've asked that question before, it responded instantly anyway. But I feel like it's important to have the confirmation here, and I would like to add that to the maths one. There is a new text-to-speech engine coming out for Raspi soon. Oh, well, just a new text-to-speech engine in general. It can be used in things other than Raspi, called Mimic3 from the Mycroft team. So we'll have to see if that's any faster. Um, but it also says liters as lighters, but you can fix that because there are custom pronunciations. I just haven't changed that yet. So it's got all of the units that kind of came to my head as what would be useful for a voice assistant. It does do metric and imperial, um, though just the imperial ones I can think of. Maybe there are ones that I just don't know of. Um, you know, like feet and yards and pounds and stones and miles and weird stuff. But I have removed... I was originally going to have more precise measurements. I was going to add nanometers and, and micrometers and things. But I just realized that those probably wouldn't be very useful, even if they might work. And so... Having less unused options will mean it's more certain of what you're saying. Like, if I have more, you know, if I have kilometers 
and some people might pronounce that as kilometers if I have kilometers and micrometers and nanometers and centimeters there are more potential things I could have said before meter so having less options it makes the voice responses more likely to be accurate but so we can test converting metric to imperial I'll do blueberry what is 10 miles to kilometers which should be 16 point oh nine it thought I asked a maths question, but you know, <laughs> it's not perfect. Let's try again. Blueberry, what's 10 miles to kilometers? 10 miles is 16.93 kilometers. And that works fine too. What's 1,043 milliliters to fluid ounces? So I forgot that we can't go above a thousand because of the way I've got this. Um, blueberry, what's 972 milliliters to fluid ounces? This one is actually going particularly wrong. I don't think it's the, f I think it doesn't like the fluid ounces. I just realized what the problem was. I just realized what the problem was with me trying a lot of those things if you know maybe you noticed this when i showed you the sentence i accidentally did a, a range of 1 to 60 for the potential numbers i could say um so i think i must have copied some of that code from the timer section so i will fix that immediately but <laughs> for metric to imperial then let's try blueberry what's two liters to fluid ounces So it does, it does work. The more complex things get and the closer some words might sound to numbers and especially the fact that I got the number range wrong, things can start going wrong, evidently. And, and I don't want to pretend that doesn't happen. But I think the success rate is reasonable when you're not just going for demos of things. Like if I think of a random number, blueberry, what's 34 centimeters to kilometers? I forgot it rounds things, so it, yeah, okay. Um, blueberry, what's 34 meters to kilometers? 34 meters is 0 0.34 kilometers. Wait, what? So that should have been 34 divided by 1,000, which would have been 0 0.034. So the code is right. So I think that's just a te the, the text-to-speech, not knowing how to handle that. Okay, I got worried that I did something wrong. Whatever, unit conversion is not perfect, and I don't pretend it to be. Um, it's just, it mostly works enough. And finally, Bluetooth pairing, where I've had to switch camera angle because I've been recording on my phone. But basically, oh, I'll, I'll turn on screen recording so you can see this better. Um, I can say, Blueberry, turn on Bluetooth pairing. And then on my phone, I just tap on the, well, yeah, it says turning turning on Bluetooth pairing, and then on my phone, it says problem connecting, turn device off and back on, uh, but it does work. So if I go and find a video, then we can see that the video is playing on here, and if I put the mic up to the speaker, it's working. And so I can show you the latency from before if I press stop. It's quite fast. But now we're back, like the final shot of the last video. It's a circular narrative, or it's something. Things are coming along quite well, but there is one problem. Maybe second time's the charm. If you have any idea, any, anything from an idea to dev skills to hardware knowledge that would be helpful for turning this into something self-contained rather than a Raspberry Pi connected to a PlayStation Eye camera and a speaker, Please do get involved if you would actually like to, you know, wh whether it be make one yourself or you know someone who would want to make one or even if you just find this interesting. 
I'm only so skilled. And and remember, I'm not the mastermind behind all of this. I wrote a Python script. The Home Assistant developers have made a whole platform for unifying smart home things. And the Raspberry developers have made a way to connect all of these individual services like text-to-speech or speech-to-text or intent handling or you know just then telling a script an intent handler to do something they've managed to unify all of that into something that's an easy way to manage a voice assistant those are the two projects that are actually worth thinking are cool at all i wrote a bit i, I wrote a little python script is all i've done so whether you want to contribute to those whether you want to join the discord server that's below um I, it doesn't really matter just if you like it know that all of these things are open source, and you can contribute if you'd like to. Anyway, there's a video the algorithm thinks you'll like, and there's my newest video, or the next one in this series when that's out. I really hope you've enjoyed. Um, bye.